Now, an eighth special presentation. This week on Art Beat Nation, ballerinas capture an era of tragedy. My point of view is that light should be used as a way to talk about contemporary issues. An artist's every tile mirrors a piece of nature. That's where I go to photograph and capture something that doesn't have the traces of man. A Renaissance man explores the art of meditation. It's important to me to make a difference in the world. And a clock artist turns trash into treasures. I like finding some little gadget that doesn't work anymore and then finding out what's inside. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Beat Nation. Funding for Art Beat Nation is made possible by contributions to aid from viewers like you. Thank you. We start with the Colorado Ballet, a troupe endeavoring to portray one of the darkest periods in human history. Their production of Light, the Holocaust and Humanity Project, combines contemporary ballet with Holocaust education, promoting the protection of human rights through arts and public dialogue. point of view is that light should be used um, as a way to talk about contemporary issues, using the Holocaust as a jumping off point. Well, Light the Holocaust and Humanity Project came out of a long discussion that I was <clears throat> having with myself um, after the events of 9-11 as an artist, okay. and that sent me on a search. Um, and it led me uh, to a, a survivor of the Holocaust named Naomi Warren. And from my discussions with Naomi came this uh, project. I took it upon myself to illustrate the fact that the issues of the Holocaust are present with us today. Issues of human rights, bigotry, hate, you're standing in Auschwitz, you can, you can sense the resonance of what, what took place, the hundreds of thousands of people that were murdered on this site. You know, and I just said to myself, I didn't come here to cry. I came here to learn, and I came here to do something. Go. This project has impacted me uh, very much. To just let go and be in the moment is really special. It's a performance where we as dancers don't have to think about dance steps. We don't have to think about technique or turning out or pointing, which we always have to think about when we're performing. We can let that go and just concentrate on the story and how to tell this journey of these people that had to suffer through so much. This pop-up, uh, the guy needs to give you enough energy that you just that. Right. There's a metaphoric period of these loud sirens that, for me, indicates this disruption of being put on these cars and transported for days to places unknown, this claustrophobic sort of feeling that takes place. the siren pushing them, pushing them, and the audience as well. People stepping onto that circle, and then people stepping off the circle of life until there's one survivor left, and that's Naomi. Working on a project like this is, is very profound. Um, it's life-changing. It has been life-changing for me. It's really taught me a lot about, about people, about um, human connections, about being strong.
I think the most important thing about viewing a work like this um, is to think about how it's relevant in your own life. I've been touched by how people can come out of it and still be hopeful and still have love and, you know, still want to live. I mean, it's these stories that I've read are just heartbreaking. And what's so inspiring is that they've, they've taken these horrible experiences and just turn, turned around and, and lived these, these long, beautiful lives. When you were in the presence of someone sharing that sort of personal information with you, it's, it's the most amazing gift uh, that could ever be given to you. Sometimes when you learn something metaphorically, it reaches you more deeply than, than knowing it intellectually because you know it spiritually. certainly is a way to soothe uh, a battered spirit, but I think also art has the potential to teach. To learn more, visit coloradoballet.org. In Texas, artist Dixie Friend Gay is making the airport a calmer place, one mosaic at a time. Here's a look. When I was in graduate school, I was studying roots of religion, and I traveled a lot in Europe, and I was just blown away by the mosaics. They could be 2,000 years old and still be as vibrant. And when I turned 40, I said, okay, this is what I'm doing. I want to make big, big work, really large work, and I want to work with the mosaic. I'm interested in preserving that parts of nature that are still left. You know, those little pieces of land that we have that's original. That's where I go to photograph and document and try to capture something that doesn't have the traces of man. When I was working on the Houston Bayou, I was in the down in the bayous in the kayaking. Started doing sketches, did preliminary thumbnail work, did small little paintings. And then I did the large painting, which is, I think, about eight, 20 feet long. And I used the fabricators in Cuernavaca, Mexico. I took my painting down there and we actually drew it off on large uh, sheets of paper and then cut the paper up and then they look at my painting and interpret it in glass. This dragonfly has 24 karat gold in it, so I've got a lot of iridescent qualities that the dragonfly has, and it was a lot of fun to uh, work on getting the fabrication just right on that. Why mosaics work so well in a public space? Because from a distance, they can appear to be a painting or an image that you can see, and as you walk up to it, it becomes almost like confetti, and it breaks up and becomes very abstract. When I did the Port of Miami, it's called Ephemeral Everglades, and I spent weeks hiking and kayaking and boating all through the Everglades to try to capture that vastness of nature. I spent a month at the prairie at a certain time of the year for Indianapolis and really being intimate with it to understand the shape of the plants and the birds at that particular time of year. The Dallas airport I just finished in March. It is 18 feet high and 64 feet wide and it's of the prairie. 
in the springtime, so it has a, all the native flowers in bloom. And it has a, a lot of handmade ceramic in it, and it also has something new that I hadn't done before is we have bulged out some of the flowers so they're three-dimensional. All my newest work has handmade clay tiles in it. The first piece that I did with my own ceramic pieces was called Strata and it's in the woodlands. The next piece I did was for Texas A&M and it, we did the benthic zone all here in my studio. But my process on these smaller pieces were, it's kind of going back to the surrealist where they would do a print and then they would find the message in the print. And I knew I wanted to work on the cellular level, the atomic level, so I played around with uh, that organic shape and those colors. And working on these small pieces really changed the color of my palette. It became much brighter. The hours of solitude and placing the, the tile and stuff was so zen, which is addictive. It's, it's a wonderful place to go. To learn more, visit DixieFriendGay.com. Dougie Padilla has been a mainstay of the Twin Cities art scene for over 25 years. He's a painter, printmaker, installation artist, and more. Up next, we learn how this Renaissance man finds his inspiration and inner peace. It's important to me to make a difference in the world because I came out of the 60s. I, I think it's basically utopianism. I think when the Beatles sang, we can change the world, I bought it. I meditate, so I have the experience of one-pointedness. But I also let myself drift. A combination of focus and giving up control at the same time. And it's about the ability to walk between worlds and there's a lot of different worlds to walk between. And this is sort of having one foot in this world and one foot in some other place. And I'm trying to um, sort of stretch between those two things and doing it with my hands by creating things. I am primarily a painter. I do a lot of drawing. I've got 85 journals slash art books. I do printmaking. I do installations, ofrendas, and shrines. I do sculpture. I do a little bit of performance, but it's mostly for the gods. Why would I be working with a non-human audience? Well, gratitude. You know, it's, it's also a little bit more like gardening, where you are acknowledging that you're only part of the process. I mean, nobody goes into a garden and goes, look at that tomato plant, I did that. But yet we get to the art world, and, and artists have a rather large ego, and they go, ah, I did that. Well, maybe. You did part of it. <laughs> I'm 
I'm self-taught. I've never taken an art class. Unless you count the one in seventh grade where we learned to make enameled tie clips. <laughs> a lot of what I do comes out of working in the building trades, carpentry and house painting. And uh, I went to welding school and learned how to use my hands. And uh, I love technical art, but I, that's just not my mode. I, I made a decision long ago that I just didn't want technique to stand between me and what I was up to. I have an iconology that I work with a lot. There's fish over and over again in my work. I grew up fishing. It's Minnesota. I have dreams about fish. I mean, why do we... Why do we live in a world surrounded by cars, but we still dream about fish? I don't dream about cars. I dream about fish. I have skulls, but they're Day of the Dead skulls. They're not like goth skulls or heavy metal skulls. And my skulls are pink and lime green. Day of the Dead is a big deal for me, but why is it a big deal for me? Well, a connection to Mexico, this, that, and the other. But also it's because, you know, I'm getting older. Mortality is a, an issue for me. And has been since I had my first heart failure at 20. It's an old, old tradition in Buddhism to meditate in the graveyards. So the whole dance with death, or whether you choose to not dance with death, is part of what determines your relationship with life. And so working with the skull icon, and what happens if it's pink with big polka dots on it? Does that allow me to face my mortality more? I'm not sure, but something's going on. Something's going on inside me where, I, you know, um, Heck, dying isn't the hard part. Living's more difficult. Um, I've cl come close enough a number of times. I was raised in St. Louis Park with the Norwegian Lutheran side of the family. My father was half Mexican and half cowboy. I could sight read and sing Bach cantatas by the time I was 11 because of all the choir training I had. My mother was a music teacher. I mean, I didn't like it at the time because all I wanted to do was play center field like Willie Mays. I went away to college for a short, uh, illustrious career uh, where I seemed to major in fighting against the war in Vietnam, uh, civil rights. Fall of 66, I went to where Allen Ginsberg was reading. And up till that time, I thought the beats were phonies. And Allen Ginsberg blew my mind. Eventually came back to Minnesota where I studied with a Zen master here in town. Somewhere along the line, when I was about 30, I'd always been involved in music and writing, and then it shifted and I just woke up one day and I was a visual artist. That's kind of how I got here. I helped found and was on the board of uh, Art of World. I helped Robert Bly found the Minnesota Men's Retreats and that whole men's movement. Grupo Soap del Corazon is the Latino artist group that I co-founded with Javier Tavera that is now 12 years old. My latest is I've been thinking a lot about starting a museum. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Meditating. Some days are horrible. You just, your mind's filled with junk. You sit there and watch the junk. And other days you sit down and you just sail, you know? And it's the same way in here. The other day I counted 37 projects that were laid out in the studio. But that didn't include the things that are in my notebooks and lists. I literally have written down projects for the next 30 years of my life, you know? And they're all different. The ideas are so seductive. I try to write them all down and then just let go because it's you just can't keep up with them. The thing that's hard for me is there's always new things to start. I'm trying to create a place where the soul feels nurtured and where our sense of enchantment comes back in life so that you walk in, you look at my paintings, you look at the work, you're in this place and you feel that once again that the world is in fact magical place. To learn more, visit DougiePadilla.com.
Artist Richard Burkett of Otigo, New York has been making fantasy clocks for almost 30 years. Having showcased his work in over 80 galleries around the world, Burkett says he spends most of his time turning trash into treasures. Take a look. Hi, I'm Richard Burkett, Fantasy Clocks. I'm the master of the universe and ruler of this time-space continuum. I basically started, well, it's been just a hair over 29 years ago, and I had been working as a furniture mover and also as a, I was a painter sculptor down in New York City. And I saw on one of the moving jobs this clock, and I go over to pick it up, and it was a tall thing, and I pick it up, it's just, and I looked, wood. And, I asked the woman, she says, oh, I went to a thing where I paid the guy $100, so there was a bunch of us. He gave us all the materials and the movements, and we made these clocks. And this was a few years before I started, but I sort of filed that away as anybody can make a clock. When my wife and I decided to have kids, I decided I should have to, we should move out of the city, so I... Uh, started making clocks and they were much different looking than they are now but at the same time they were considered extremely strange looking for the time. Most people didn't even know they were clocks. They looked, looked more like uh, three-dimensional paintings or um, Mondrian done off the wall. First ten years of doing them it was mostly galleries and museums and stuff like that that were buying them and I would do uh, some little shows in the well they weren't that little in Manhattan and uh, it took off right away some of the people you know uh, they bring me things like this woman who has one of my clocks from 1985 and she's got a couple other clocks and she brought me a whole shopping bag full of 19 blackberries and boy am I having fun with those. It's you know one of those things where I, I, I enjoy taking things apart. I like finding some little gadget that doesn't work anymore and then finding out what's inside. Sometimes there's nothing in there. I always have liked the looks of clocks and the idea of time is fascinating. I just don't know as, uh, I don't always put the two together. Uh, it's kind of like uh, time is an interesting concept, but uh, there's probably something out there better to replace it. I just haven't found it yet. Basically, uh, the reason I make clocks is I really have very little interest in time. Actually, my company motto is time is irrelevant, it's clocks that are important. Uh, uh, and, you know, it's basically, they just seem, you know, it's the practicality of them. If you don't have one of my clocks when the mothership comes back, it is the ticket. So, you know, clocks, clocks are good. Fantasy clocks are even better. So, we'll see you in the future. To learn more, visit fantasyclock.com. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation was made possible by contributions to aid from viewers like you. Thank you.